Well, tonight we are going to be in 2 Kings chapters 13 and 14. I'd like to try to cover both of those chapters this evening, 2 Kings 13 and 14. We will refer a couple of times when we come to the reign of Amaziah to the material in 2 Chronicles 25. So if you want to put a finger there, that's fine, but we will not spend much time there at all, just make brief reference. We are still in the period of the divided kingdom, although that period is drawing very rapidly to a close. You'll remember that when King Jehu was raised to power by Yahweh to execute judgment against the family of Ahab, that God's promise to Jehu was that because of his faithfulness, at least in that task, his sons would sit upon the throne to the fourth generation. And we're going to look at three of those four descendants tonight, three kings of the northern kingdom and one king of the southern kingdom, Amaziah, whose reign overlaps with them. We're also going to see in these chapters the death uh, of the prophet Elisha and his final prophecy and even uh, a final act of power that is attributable obviously not to him but to the Lord himself even after his servant's death. And I think it's significant that we see Elisha's death at this juncture and kind of in this context because Elisha's death could very easily be seen as a great discouragement, as, as if he was the last hope of Israel as if he were the last righteous man. Of course, we know he wasn't the last righteous man, but it at least seems that way when you're reading the story. It seems like there are no good guys left, and, and the nation is inevitably going to plunge into greater darkness and destruction. But the way in which the final days of Elisha are described in this, in this passage and the way that even his death itself works powerfully as a sign for the people, I think is intended to give us hope that there is hope beyond death, beyond judgment. Uh, there is hope as long as God is with his people. Uh, let's begin by reading the first nine verses of, of 2 Kings chapter 13. In the 23rd year of Jehoash, excuse me, of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, and he reigned 17 years. He did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh and followed the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He did not depart from them. And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he gave them continually into the hand of Haziel king of Syria and into the hand of Ben-Hadad the son of Haziel. Then Jehoahaz sought the favor of Yahweh, and Yahweh listened to him. For he saw the oppression of Israel, how the king of Syria oppressed them. Therefore Yahweh gave Israel a savior so that they escaped from the hand of the Syrians and the people of Israel lived in their homes as formerly. Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin, but walked in them. And the Asherah also remained in Samaria. For there was not left to Jehoahaz an army of more than 50 horsemen and 10 chariots and 10,000 footmen. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust at threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz and all that he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Jehoahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria, and Joash his son reigned in his place. Now you'll notice that at the beginning of that unit, that paragraph, verse 1, there is a reference to the 23rd year of Joash. And in verse 9, at the end of that paragraph, there is a reference to Joash his son. These are, of course, two different Joashes. Sometimes it's spelled Joash in the biblical text. Sometimes it's Jehoash. And so those two terms are interchangeable, even as you see me goofing it up reading the text a second ago. Normally, when I'm just talking, when I'm, when I'm not reading the text, I'll refer to the northern king, Joash, as Jehoash, and the southern king as Joash. Sometimes that makes it a little easier to follow. Just be advised, the Bible does not give you that help. <laughs> You're going to have to pay attention to who the daddy was and to which kingdom they are associated with. Jehoahaz is the son of Jehu, and Joash, or in this case Jehoash, we'll call him, is Jehoahaz's son. So he's Jehu's grandson. Uh, Jehoahaz's reign is fairly unremarkable. Uh, it, it is important from this standpoint that God promised that Jehu's family would retain the throne, and Jehoahaz is the first exemplar of the fulfillment of that promise. He reigns 17 years, but he does not follow the way of righteousness, but rather continues in the sin of Jeroboam. 
Now, one thing that you do see is that Jehu's war against Baal was successful. There's no return to Baalism at this point. Uh, Jehoahaz doesn't slide back into that. But sadly, you notice that not only is the golden calf worship instituted by Jeroboam at the beginning of this uh, northern kingdom's history, not only does that sin continue unchecked, unabated, but also the Asherah pole continues to be used religiously at Samaria. Now, the Asherah pole was a female goddess that was often associated with the worship of Baal. And so almost certainly, although we can't know for sure, but almost certainly uh, this is institutionalized at the same time that Baalism is made the national religion during the reign of Ahab and Jezebel. For whatever reason, that Asherah pole was not cut down and that worship of this goddess was not eradicated when Jehu eradicated Baalism. And so we see that also continuing. During this time, God brings the Syrians against Israel. Don't get confused about the difference between the Syrians and the Assyrians. The Syrians, of course, are the nation immediately to the north of Israel, uh, and the Assyrians are further north and east and are associated with a, uh, a world empire, really the first of the ancient world empires as we think of it. So God is bringing the Syrians against Israel continually, the text says. At the end of the paragraph, at the end of Jehoahaz's story, we find out that the Syrians have just absolutely decimated the military might of Jehoahaz and his administration. Uh, one commentator describes the assessment of his military strength as amounting to little more than a police force. And that's, that's true. You, you'd think, well, 10,000 soldiers, that sounds like a lot. Not in comparison to anybody around them. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's about a, a, a large police force to, to uh, govern the nation. Uh, the Syrians want to make sure that the, the northern kingdom is so hamstrung in terms of their military power that they, the best they can do is just keep order within their borders. They cannot go beyond those borders. They won't be any threat to Syria or to anyone else. But during this time, as the Syrians are oppressing Israel in this way, Jehoahaz has the gall to call out to Yahweh, and Yahweh listens to him, and Yahweh sends relief. Now, there is a question. The Bible says that God raised up a Savior, verse 5. He gave Israel a Savior so that they escaped from the hand of the Syrians, but it does not appear that they escaped during the reign of Jehoahaz. And so some people have wondered, well, what Savior is being referred to? Was this an event in the reign of Jehoahaz that is just unrecorded? Was it Jehoahaz's son or grandson, Jeroboam II? Uh, was it a reference to the prophet Elisha, perhaps, or someone else? I tend to think that it's a reference to the salvation and deliverance God gives to the northern kingdom in the subsequent administrations, specifically in the reign of Jeroboam II. But commentators are divided on that. But, but however that was specifically fulfilled, the fact is that's what God did. He, he listened to Jehoahaz and he raised up a savior for the northern kingdom. And yet, sadly, Jehoahaz's repentance was not genuine or lasting and they continued in their sinful ways. And so you might, you might wonder, well, why would God listen to him? I want to suggest two practical applications, and we're going to clip through some of these units pretty quickly because most of these kings are unremarkable. But, but in the first case, with regard to Jehoahaz, we need to see that God is kind and merciful to inadequate repenters. He's kind and merciful to inadequate repenters because that's the only kind of repenters that there are. You and I are not saved by having a perfect faith. We're not saved by having a perfect repentance. And don't misunderstand. Don't, don't go home and suggest that, well, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't have to repent very seriously or very thoroughly because God is kind and merciful to inadequate repenters. No, no, no. no that's not what we're talking about. Uh, God is kind and merciful, though, to people whose repentance falls far short of what true repentance ought to be. In an ideal world, if we were to repent of our sin, we would never return to sin again. But I don't know how many times you've repented today and how many times subsequent to that repentance you've sinned, and you don't know either because that's just how thoroughly sinful we are. God is kind and merciful even to inadequate repenters. And, and it's, a, it's a remarkable thing when you see in Matthew chapter 3 and Mark chapter 1, Jesus of Nazareth coming to John the Baptist. And John is baptizing with a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It's the same construction as in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 on the day of Pentecost. 
A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In other words, a baptism that symbolizes repentance, that symbolizes this turning away from sin, turning to the Lord, and that is looking to the promise of forgiveness. That's what John's doing. And so Jesus of Nazareth shows up. And you say, why in the world would Jesus be baptized by John? He has nothing of, for which he needs to repent, right? So a baptism of repentance is entirely out of place in Jesus' experience. And he has no sins that need to be forgiven. So he's not looking ahead to the promise of forgiveness, right? Uh, so John says to Jesus, without even understanding all of those things, without even really truly knowing who Jesus is at this point, other than the fact that he's his cousin, he says, I need to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? And Christ says... Permit it to be so, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now, this is something important for you and I to recognize. You don't have a perfect baptism. You don't have perfect repentance. But in Christ, we have a perfect baptism and a perfect repentance. Right? And again, it's not to say, oh, well, then, pastor, I don't have to be baptized because in Christ I have a perfect baptism. No, no, Jesus commands you to be baptized. Well, pastor, I don't have to repent because in Jesus I have a perfect repentance. No, Jesus commands you to repent. But the reality is you are not saved by the adequacy of any of your responses to God. Jehoahaz, is, his repentance is not adequate. His repentance is not only not adequate, it's arguably not even sincere. Now, maybe it was sincere at the moment, right? But it was a fleeting sincerity at best. He's not committed to Yahweh. He's committed to Yahweh as practiced, uh, as worshipped in the system of religion instituted by Jeroboam, his predecessor, right? He's not truly committed to the Lord. He continues in his sinful ways. And yet, how kind and merciful is our God? Even that kind of repentance God shows mercy toward. Now, how much more encouraged should you be who are committed to the Lord? You are a Christian. You're not worshiping Yahweh by means of a golden calf. You're not seeking to follow uh, your, the dictates of your own heart. And, and yet your repentance is similarly inadequate. Your response to God is similarly uh, insufficient. And yet God is kind and merciful to inadequate repenters. And so you and I need to be encouraged. We need to take heart from that to say, yes, my repentance is inadequate. And when the devil throws that back at you and says, you really think God's going to forgive you? I mean, you repent and then you fall right back into sin. True, true, but that's hardly the point, is it? It's not the point because God is kind and merciful to those who do not have an adequate repentance. And then secondly, the kindness of God should lead us to true repentance. And this is unfortunately a point that we see is true throughout Scripture, but we don't see it worked out in Jehoahaz's own experience. Why would God be kind and merciful to people who make motions toward him, but they do not ultimately prove lasting? Well, Paul says in Romans chapter 2, do you not know that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? The kindness of God. He doesn't sit back with his arms folded, with a scowl on his face, saying, when you get serious about repentance, then I will get serious about being kind to you. He is kind to people who are impenitent. He is kind to people who are unseriously repentant. And why? So that the kindness of God might lead us to repentance. God does something for Jehoahaz and for the northern kingdom that they do not deserve. And you and I could read this text, you know, kind of as in a pharisaical way, and we could say, what is the Lord doing here? Obviously, he knows this man's heart. He knows that he's not genuine. This people are not obedient to the Lord. Uh, he should not respond to them in this way. But in how many ways today, just today, has God been kind and merciful to you far beyond what you deserve? We are not in hell, right? This would be justice, but we are not in hell. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. And so the kindness of God is not only shown to those who are inadequately repentant, the kindness of God is intended to lead us to true repentance. Will God's mercy soften our hearts, or will it embolden us in our sin? Because those, those are the two outcomes that are possible. Well, we pick up in verse 10 and read about Jehoahaz's son, Jehoash. Verse 10, in the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 16 years. 
He also did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin, but he walked in them. Now the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did and the might with which he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Joash slept with his fathers, and Jeroboam sat on his throne, and Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. If it wasn't already confusing enough that we have a Joash in the south, and now we have a Joash in the north, the Joash in the north chooses to name his son Jeroboam, who we've also already had. So it just, this gets very, very complicated. But again, if you will take the time to memorize the kings of Israel and Judah, this is where it really starts to pay dividends because it helps you keep some of these people straight. There is very little to say about Jehoash. Very little. Now we're going to mention a little bit when we come to Amaziah. We'll go over to Chronicles, as I said, for just a moment. And note that he fights against Judah and actually wins a great victory. He's an instrument of God's judgment against the southern kingdom of Judah. But other than that, there's really nothing to say about Jehoash. And this makes a point. This is not the point of application, but this is a point that we need to recognize. And that is, thus will be the fate of all the wicked. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly will perish. The Lord knows the righteous. That's what the psalmist says in Psalm 1-6. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly will perish. Right now, our nation, our society, our culture, our global civilization is fixated upon certain celebrities. You know, it may not be the same celebrities in every nation, but in every nation there are celebrities and whether it is the, the dictator of a, 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 you know, a tyrannical regime or whether it is a movie star or a musician or what, whatever, a social media influencer, whatever that is, I guess that's a thing now. Um, there, we are fascinated by celebrities. And without painting with too broad a brush, maybe some of them are brothers and sisters in Christ, let's acknowledge that the majority of these celebrities upon whom everyone's attention is fixated, they're unbelievers. They're wicked people. Sometimes they're, they're infamously wicked people. And yet it seems like they're so important. It seems like they're the ones who are really leaving a mark on the world. It seems like they're the ones who are going to be remembered. And a whole lot of God's saints are, are going to just be forgotten. If you haven't read The Great Divorce, you should really read The Great Divorce. It's a great, great help and comfort in your Christian life. C.S. Lewis imagines a busload of people going from hell to, to the outskirts of heaven and given an opportunity to remain there. I know it sounds like heresy, but, but honestly, just you should, you should read the story. In that story, the observer and narrator meets a woman who seems almost like a goddess. She is so brilliant. She is heralded. She is loved. She is celebrated. And he learns that in life and on earth, she was utterly insignificant. Like nobody knew who she was. Nobody cared who she was. The most ordinary person you could imagine, but a saint, a servant of God. And how things have been turned on their heads, right? The last will be first and the first last. One day, the great and mighty powerful kings like Jehoash are going to be relegated to a footnote in redemptive history. You remember Jehoash who reigned over the northern kingdom? I, I, I vaguely remember him, but uh, what did he do? Nothing. Nothing. And yet, you know, we're going to not only know the names, we're going to actually meet and have conversations with the 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal in that northern kingdom during Elijah's life. Do you realize that? I mean, you're going to have time to meet them because we're going to have a lot of time, right? Eternity. You're going to shake their hands. This is not a fairy tale. You're going to meet those saints. We don't know their names today. One day you will know their names. How awesome is that, right? Do not follow your fathers in their former sins. That's the practical application for the reign of Jehoash in the northern kingdom. This is the only thing that is remarkable about him, and unfortunately it's the same thing that is remarked upon about every one of the kings of the northern kingdom. Tradition is good, but only if it is intelligently and purposefully embraced. I want every one of my children to remain a committed, conservative, confessional, unapologetically biblical, reformed Christian for the rest of their life. We pray almost every Lord's Day in one way or another from the pulpit 
that our children would excel us in serving the Lord. We want them to be faithful where we have been unfaithful. We want them to be fruitful where we have been barren. And I want that not because they simply blindly adopt and embrace as if they were led by the nose, whatever mom and dad believe, but because they have met the Lord. Because they've met the Lord for themselves. They've been born from above. They've seen it in scripture and they can't unsee it. And it doesn't matter if mom and dad and everybody else in the world turns away from it. They're, they're going to Zion. And that's their commitment. Now, what you see in Jehoash is the uncritical opposite. Where he follows in the tradition of his forebears. He's a religious person, whatever that means. But he's committed to a religion that is not true. He's committed to a religion that ends in disaster and destruction. Why didn't someone among all the 19 kings of the northern kingdom challenge the status quo? But they didn't. Jehu comes the closest, but he doesn't. He eradicates Baal, but he just uncritically embraces these golden calves because they are so embedded in their, in their society, in their consciousness, that they never stop to say, you know, the law says nothing about this. In fact, the law forbids this. The law prohibits this. This is not of God. This is not biblical. Some, someone has to stand up. And, and ultimately, it doesn't happen until God raises someone up, like a German monk, to reread the New Testament and say, you know something? We've got this wrong. But Jehoash does not. Do not follow your fathers in their former sins. The fact that a lot of other foolish people follow the same paths before you doesn't mean that it's any less foolish. Now in verse 14, we meet with the end of the prophet Elisha. And I want to read the second half of the chapter, see all of it. There are basically kind of three points, three parts to the, to the narrative in two, two main sections. Uh, verse 14 says, Now when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, Draw the bow. And he drew it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, Yahweh's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria. For you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground with them. And he struck three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. But now you will strike down Syria only three times. So Elisha died and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen. And the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Now Haziel, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz, but Yahweh was gracious to them and had compassion on them, and he turned toward them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them, nor has he cast them from his presence until now. When Haziel, king of Syria, died, Ben-Hadad, his son, became king in his place. Then Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, took again from Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, the cities that he had taken from Jehoahaz, his father, in war. Three times Joash defeated him and recovered the cities of Israel. And again, that may be the Savior that is referred to during the life of Jehoahaz, during the earlier uh, portion of text in verse 5 that we read, or it may be the greater military um, independence that is obtained by Jeroboam II, Jehoash's son. So this is, a, this is a bittersweet part of the story because God's saints grow old and God's saints fall ill with the illness that will bring about their death. And Elisha appears to know that that's what's happening because the king comes to him and it seems pretty well recognized that this is the end. In fact, Jehoash is, is weeping and crying in the very words of 
Elisha at the time of Elijah's departure, which just as an, as an aside, that suggests that that story has been told now for many years and has entered so far into the public consciousness that even a king who is not particularly a committed follower of Yahweh is familiar with it. So you remember when Elijah and Elisha are crossing the Jordan and Elijah is going to be taken by the Lord, he's not going to die, but he's taken up in a whirlwind and a chariot of fire separates Elijah and Elisha. And as Elijah is carried up, Elisha cries this way, the chariots of Israel and her horsemen. And now that's what Jehoash is saying at Elisha's bedside. What you see is that even a, uh, an ungodly man, even an impious man, recognizes the holiness of Elisha. We've talked about this before. Uh, Herod's respect for John the Baptist, even though he ultimately orders his death, right? Both Felix and Festus, their reverence for the Apostle Paul, even though neither of them are Christians and not going to become Christians, right? But the, the perception of even ungodly people recognizing that they are in the presence of a holy man. Well, Elisha instructs the king to take a bow and a quiver of arrows and to act out this two-step parable regarding the actions of Israel against their enemies, the Syrians. He interprets this very specifically after the first arrow is launched. And then in the second phase of the parable, whether, uh, whether as we probably most of us commonly have assumed, whether the king is hitting the ground with the arrows or whether he's actually shooting the arrows into the ground, either way, at that point, the king knows what this represents. He knows what we're doing, right? We're not just playing with a bow and arrows. This is a sign. This is a symbol. This is a picture of the victory that God is going to give uh, to Israel over the Syrians. And so he shoots this arrow out the window, and then he strikes three times into the ground with the arrows, but then he stops. Now, this seems kind of bizarre, because immediately Elisha is very offended and indignant, and he says, you should have kept striking. You should have struck five or six times, because then you would have defeated the Syrians utterly. Now you'll only win three times. We might say, well, you know, Elisha, aren't you overreacting a little bit? You didn't tell him how many times to strike. But no, what you're supposed to see is that he stopped. That's what you're supposed to pay attention to. That the king is told explicitly what this is about, and here is the regard that Jehoash has for the word of God. Now, I don't, I don't know, we don't have video of the incident, so I don't want to try to peer too far into Jehoash's you know, heart and mind. Is he, is he embarrassed, kind of tired of this sort of foolishness? Is, does, does he regard this as a, as a, as a silly thing? Uh, is, he, is he just uh, fails to take it seriously? Well, what's the problem here? You've just been told that this is going to be symbolic of your victory over the Syrians who have just worn you out for, for two generations now. And he strikes three times and then stops. This is how much regard he has for the word of God. It is not much at all. He may have feigned great affection for Elisha, but he had little respect for the God of Elisha. And then there is the, the next episode, uh, a very bizarre story, because sometime after Elisha's death, as marauding bands of Moabites are passing through the land, a burial party is carrying the corpse of their friend to bury him. Remember that these tombs are just caves, right, in the side of a hill. We're not talking about digging somebody up and chucking them in on top of Elisha, right? but just burying them in a mass grave, in a, in a cave. And as they see the Moabites coming, they chuck the body into the cave rather than taking the time to place him properly. And the body hits up against whatever's left of Elisha, his bones, whether it's a desiccated corpse or whatever state it's in. And when the newly dead person touches the dead body of Elisha, he resuscitates. We call these resuscitations not because they're not truly dead and made truly alive, but because that guy's going to die again, right? So he's, he's raised back to life. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, commentators offer many different ideas, but I think we should be content in this case simply to see that no matter how grim the circumstances may be, no matter how hopeless things may seem, God's power transcends death and even the lives of his servants. And I say it that way because, as I said at the introduction, 
we may be inclined to feel like all hope is lost when Elisha dies. He's the last good guy. He was the last hope for Israel. The governor is off. The, the kingdom is now plunging over the precipice. And yet God does not need Elisha. He did not need Elijah. He does not need Joel Ellis. He does not need this church. He does not need you. It is all of grace. God needs us in the same way that I needed my three-year-old little boy's help when I would be dragging an 85-pound trash can to the road every week. And he'd say, Dad, I want to help you take the trash. Really? Okay. He makes it harder. I have to bend down further. You get a crick in your back. You've got to make sure the trash can doesn't fall on his head. But you let him help. Why? Because you need his help? No. It would be easier if he didn't help, right? But, but you let him help because he needs to help. He needs to learn something of what it means to participate in the family kingdom. And God uses his servants, and he uses them mightily, and he used Elisha in mighty and impressive ways. But if you think that all hope is lost because Elisha is in a tomb, let me tell you something. God's power is not turned off. God's power has not died. This is not the kind of thing where you can make a pilgrimage, and if you can find the, the, uh, you know, the ruins of Elisha's tomb and touch those bones, then, then you're going to uh, you know, be, be given life again. It's not that kind of thing. It's just simply making this point that not even death is greater than the power of God, and therefore his servants should never despair. Two points of application from this particular portion of our text tonight. First, we see here the public vindication of the saints of God, that even unholy men will one day acknowledge God's saints. You won't see that with every unholy person in the present age, but one day you will see it of every unholy person that's ever lived. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and part of what will happen on that day is the saints of God will be vindicated. Every thing that's been said against you, every lie that's been told, every slander that's been uttered, every false thing that people have believed, and every rotten, sorry, scummy thing that you've done that God has forgiven you and me for, we will be vindicated on that day with Christ. And praise God for that. Praise God. Secondly, the slack hand results in small victories. We have to take God's word seriously, not indifferently. I mean, this king is given an opportunity through acting out this parable to say, here is, here is a picture of your victory. Now, how are you going to receive that word? How are you going to participate in that victory? God is holding it out to you. Do you want it? And he says, well, you know, take a little bit of it. Th three's enough. That, that's fine. Enough, right? I mean, this, this is the kind of foolishness that you see in the ten plagues when Moses offers relief to Pharaoh during the plague of frogs. And he says, you, you have the privilege of determining when the frogs are going to be taken away. And Pharaoh says, tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning? Why not right now? Why not this very night? Tomorrow morning. That's a, that's a heart that's indifferent to the word of God. That's a heart that doesn't take the word of God seriously. And a slack hand results in small victories. Well, let's go to chapter 14. In chapter 14, we have, for the, for the most part, uh, the, the reign of Amaziah. And this is where we will jump over to 2 Chronicles just once or twice to, to look at a couple of little pieces. But let me read the first 22 verses. In the second year of Joash, the son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Johadan of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of Yahweh, yet not like David his father. He did in all things as Joash his father had done. It's going to be important. We'll come back to that. The high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. And as soon as the royal power was firmly in his hand, he struck down his servants who had struck down the king his father. But he did not put to death the children of the murderers, according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, where Yahweh commanded, Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers, but each one shall die for his own sin. He struck down 10,000 Edomites in the valley of salt, and took Selah by storm, and called it Jokthiel, which is its name to this day. 
Then Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us look one another in the face. And Jehoash, king of Israel, sent word to Amaziah, king of Judah, a thistle on Lebanon, sent to a cedar on Lebanon, saying, Give your daughter to my son for a wife. And a wild beast of Lebanon passed by and trampled down the thistle. You have indeed struck down Edom, and your heart has lifted you up. Be content with your glory and stay at home, for why should you provoke trouble so that you fall, you and Judah with you? But Amaziah would not listen. So Jehoash king of Israel went up, and he and Amaziah king of Judah faced one another in battle at Beth Shemesh, which belongs to Judah. And Judah was defeated by Israel, and every man fled to his home. And Jehoash king of Israel captured Amaziah king of Judah, the son of Jehoash, son of Ahaziah, at Beth Shemesh, and came to Jerusalem and broke down the wall of Jerusalem for 400 cubits from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate. And he seized all the gold and silver and all the vessels that were found in the house of Yahweh and in the treasuries of the king's house, also hostages, and he returned to Samaria. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoash that he did and his might and how he fought with Amaziah king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Jehoash slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel, and Jeroboam his son reigned in his place. Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived 15 years after the death of Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel. Now the rest of the deeds of Amaziah, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish. But they sent after him to Lachish and put him to death there. And they brought him on horses, and he was buried in Jerusalem with his fathers in the city of David. And all the people of Judah took Azariah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Elath and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. And there is almost certainly a co-regency there um, and, and in a few other places, but this one's important. We'll come back to that maybe next week. Um, Amaziah was not faithful like David. He did what was right, like his father Joash. Well, now think back to Joash for a second. You say, well, no, wait a second. Wasn't, Joash was faithful at the beginning, but then didn't he kind of take a turn sideways and become unfaithful in the latter part of his life? As a matter of fact, he did. And that's exactly what Amaziah does as well. Amaziah is the only king of the southern kingdom whose reign is described in these two chapters we're looking at tonight. And the summary of his administration leaves one assuming that overall he was a righteous king. He certainly was not as wicked as other kings that had gone before him and came after him, but a more careful reading of the record leads to a more nuanced assessment. The truth is he did what was right at first, but as 2 Chronicles 25.2 says, yet not with a whole heart. He did not serve God with a whole heart. There was an outward conformity, that's true. He was more faithful than some other people were, but he was not serving God with the whole heart. He did start well. He wasn't as faithful as David, and even though the high places were not removed, he clearly showed concern for the law of Moses. And how do you see that? You see it in his refusal to put to death the sons of the assassins who killed his father. His father, Joash, remember, was assassinated. Interestingly enough, Amaziah is also going to be assassinated. There are many parallels between their lives. But he shows respect for the law of God by refusing to put to death the sons of the murderers. Amaziah furthermore goes and leads Judah in victory against the Edomites. There is a great victory there that is clearly the work of of God. And this is where I want you to put your finger in 2 Kings 14. We'll come back in just a moment, but turn over to 2 Chronicles 25 because there are a couple of pieces of this story that are very, very important for understanding the rest of what King says about Amaziah. Let me summarize the victory over Edom for the sake of time because it's rapidly running out. Um, it's recounted in verses 5 to 13. Uh, as Amaziah is preparing for war against the Edomites, he hires a large number of mercenaries from the northern kingdom of Israel. Makes sense. He doesn't have a strong enough army for this victory. He needs help. So he hires those who are ethnically Israelites, who at least ostensibly believe in Yahweh. But Yahweh says, don't trust in those mercenaries. Don't use those men. Send them back. Well, I've, I've already paid 
you know, it's cash on arrival. I mean, it's not like I pay them after they go to war because some of them are not going to survive, right? You've got to pay them up front, and, and I already paid them. The Lord basically says, Amaziah, trust me, and Amaziah does. He sends them home. Does not make the mercenaries happy, by the way, which may, in fact, be partly involved in the later devastation of Jerusalem by the northern armies. But he sends them home, he trusts God, and God gives them the victory. It's a tremendous victory. Tremendous. You can read about it in those verses. But look at verse 14 of 2 Chronicles 25. After Amaziah came from striking down the Edomites, he brought the gods of the men of Seir and set them up as his gods and worshipped them, making offerings to them. Therefore Yahweh was angry with Amaziah and sent to him a prophet who said to him, Why have you sought the gods of a people who did not deliver their own people from your hand? But as he was speaking, the king said to him, Have we made you a royal counselor? Stop. Why should you be struck down? So the prophet stopped, but said, I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and have not listened to my counsel. Does that sound familiar? I mean, how, how utterly absurd is this, right? The Edomites, who just lost this tremendous battle to the people of Judah, Amaziah sees their gods and says, you know what, those look great. And he doesn't just say, hey, I want those as spoils of war. Their gods are made out of gold. I want to take them back home and melt them down and make jewelry. No, no, no. He says, those gods look great. Let's bring them back to Jerusalem and let's worship them instead. They, he worships the Edomites' gods, the same gods, supposedly, that could not give Edom the victory against Judah. I mean, this makes no sense on any level. Obviously, spiritually, it's a disaster. But it doesn't even make sense from a carnal perspective. And so a prophet is raised up by the Lord who says, you're a fool, what are you doing? And the king threatens him. Does this sound familiar? Remember, Amaziah is like his father. What did his father do? Well, his father embraced idolatry. And when God raises up a prophet, what does he do? He puts him to death. And who's the prophet that is raised up? Jehoiada's son, Zechariah. And Joash kills him. And what does Amaziah do? He looks at this prophet, he says, shut up. Shut up. Did I make you a counselor? Do I want to hear from you? You need to shut your mouth. For why should you die? He's saying, you either be quiet or I'm going to kill you. And the prophet says, oh, oh, I realize now God's decided to kill you. And he does. Look down at verse 20. Amaziah would not listen, for it was of God in order that he might give them into the hand of their enemies because they had sought the gods of Edom. He would not listen, and it's referring specifically to his conversation with Jehoash, the king of the northern kingdom. I, I love this expression. Uh, Amaziah says to Jehoash, uh, let's go look at one another in the face. You just, what, what does that mean exactly? He's, he's saying, let's fight, right? He's saying, let's, let's fight. And Jehoash, by the way, Jehoash's response is not, any more humble than Amaziah's challenge, right? Jehoash says, stay at home. You, you don't want any of this. Don't, don't come mess with it. You, you've had a great victory with the Edomites, but just be content with that. Don't, don't come up in here. And uh, Amaziah would not listen. Why? Why would he not listen? Because God had determined to kill him. Why did God determine to kill him? Well, because God told Amaziah, if you will trust me, I will give you a victory over the Edomites. And Amaziah said, okay, God, I will trust you. And then in the victory over the Edomites, he says, you know what? I think I want to worship the Edomite gods instead. The foolishness, the foolishness of embracing vanquished idolatries. It's amazing. It's amazing. In the end, Amaziah was assassinated like his father. Now, um, none of the commentators I consulted really dealt with this, um, and, and this may be a little bit speculative, but, but what's interesting to me is that both Joash and his son Amaziah are assassinated, are murdered through a conspiracy by men who murder them because of idolatry. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that they are pro-Yahweh. They are murdered by men who want to see their sons on the throne. In other words, it's not a coup. They're not trying to capture power for themselves. 
Now, does that mean what they do is right? No, obviously not. But what it seems to suggest, this, this almost seems like a kind of a pre-zealot sort of movement, that you have a, a group of pro-Yahweh violent extremists who take matters into their own hands. And both in the case of Joash and in the case of Amaziah says, we're going to take the king out. And they do. But not for the purpose of putting another family on the throne, but rather hoping that a son of David will finally come to power who is faithful to the Lord. These are violent vigilante responses to the violent and idolatrous misconduct of both kings. And even though it's not a righteous response, we're not endorsing it in any way, it is substantively different than the assassinations you see in the northern kingdom. Uh, one commentator, James Smith, uh, said this, I think, uh, very helpfully in kind of summarizing Amaziah. He says, quote, In several respects, Amaziah's reign resembles that of his father Joash. Both were zealous for Yahweh at first, but turned to idolatry at last. Both opposed prophets and treated their rebukers with scorn. Both roused conspiracy against themselves by their misconduct. Both were murdered by malcontents. Further, both were unsuccessful in war. Both had to withstand a siege on their capital. Both bought off their enemy by the surrender of a greater part of their wealth, including the treasures of the temple, end quote. Those are astonishing parallels. And it tells you all that you need to know about Jehoash, the king of the northern kingdom, that he sacked the temple of Yahweh. In case you're wondering what his level of commitment to Yahweh is, there you go. Two points of application. And the first is what we mentioned a moment ago. The foolishness of embracing vanquished idolatries. Why would we embrace the very same idols which God has overthrown and from whose power we have been delivered? And yet, how often do we do so? Either by learning from the world how we ought to order our lives, or by returning to or embracing new besetting sins after we have been given deliverance by the Lord over our fleshly woes and foes. So this is probably not how we think about it, but, but I hope in Amaziah's experience you can see something of our own struggle. That how often has God given us deliverance like he gave to Judah against the Edomites, and we repay that kindness and mercy by embracing idolatry that we've just been delivered from. But we should see the foolishness of that and not go down that road. Secondly, the disaster of disobedience and ingratitude if we stubbornly persist in disobedience and we live with ingratitude for God's mercies and kindness, we will not succeed. There will eventually be a reckoning. It's, a, it's a, amazing because Amaziah has one of the greatest victories and one of the greatest defeats, right, in the southern kingdom's history. I mean, his, his victory over the Edomites is awesome. I mean, it's really amazing what God does. And then the king of Israel comes into Jerusalem and is like tearing down the wall. Just tearing down the wall just to show that he can just to say, this is the state of your defenses. I'm going to pull down the wall of your city. I'm going to sack your temple. I'm going to take you hostage and mistreat you and then send you back home because I don't even care that you're on the throne. That's how insignificant you are. I mean, it's like the, one of the greatest victories and one of the greatest defeats. There will be a day of reckoning. Despite the positive beginning to Amaziah's administration, he did not persist in obedience. He was not grateful for God's kindness in his life. And so in the end, he was destroyed. And you know that there will be people in hell, that that's their story. That they see the kindness of God that they spurned, that they thought so little of. That is Amaziah. Well, back in 2 Kings 14, and we've got just a few verses and just a couple of minutes left. The reign of Jeroboam II, verse 23 of 2 Kings 14. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Labo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of Yahweh, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer. For Yahweh saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left, bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. But Yahweh had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, so he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. 
Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all that he did and his might and how he fought and how he restored Damascus and Hamath to Judah and Israel, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Jeroboam slept with his fathers, the kings of Israel, and Zechariah his son reigned in his place. Don't be confused by the fact that we call him Jeroboam the second. He's not Jeroboam Jr. He's not of the same family of the first Jeroboam. It's just a way of keeping him straight. Uh, he is the uh, grand, great grandson of Jehu, the third of Jehu's descendants to sit upon the throne. He is arguably the greatest king ever to rule over the northern kingdom, and he is barely a footnote in your Bible. Economically, militarily, and territorially, his administration was a tremendous success. This would be very similar to what we said about Omri, who is probably the best attested, best known king of Israel outside of the Bible. And yet in the Bible, he's just like completely insignificant. But Jeroboam II is kind of that way. God does not evaluate the success of a ruler as men do. And Jeroboam II's rule was a spiritual failure. Now, he was a savior of sorts, and this is why I would take him as the fulfillment of that earlier promise in 13.5. But he was only a savior in a national, economic, and military sense. God granted favor to Israel during his reign according to the word that he revealed through the prophet Jonah. And yes, it is that Jonah. We'll come back to that in a second. During this time, the Assyrian Empire was in decline, and so Israel was able to expand her borders, strengthen her economy, and enjoy a season of peace and prosperity, but that was not to last for long. We are now bare decades, barely a couple of decades, from the destruction of the northern kingdom by that same Assyrian Empire. Jeroboam II's reign is the historical backdrop and important context for the book of Jonah. And I want you to understand this, but Jacob may have dealt with this some when he, when he did his introduction to Jonah some weeks ago. But during Jonah's lifetime, Israel is in revival. Not spiritually, but economically, militarily, politically, they're in revival. It's been described by commentators as the Indian summer of Israel. Everything is going in the right direction right before they're destroyed. Simultaneously, Assyria is in decline. That's the reason things are going well in Israel and in other nations in the ancient Near East. And you gotta know that Assyria, they were bloodthirsty, godless people. I mean, absolutely wicked, vile, awful people. Horrific stories of war crimes, right? And, and, and so Israel is coming back, Assyria is in decline, and God tells Jonah, I want you to go to the capital of the Assyrian Empire and I want you to preach a message that Jonah knows good and well is likely to lead to God showing mercy to these people. It, it would be like at the height of the war on terror, when, when we are beginning to gain an upper hand against Al-Qaeda or against the Taliban, and God raises up a preacher and he says, I want you to go into the heart of their country and I want you to preach the gospel. Right? This would be a time of great patriotism great national spirit and enthusiasm, and Jonah says, no way. I don't want them forgiven. I want you to kick them while they are down. <laughs> we don't want them to get back up. That's the backdrop for Jonah's refusal to go to Nineveh and preach. Imagine a preacher going to preach the gospel among the Nazis shortly after D-Day when it appeared that the Allies were gaining ground and, and it looked like the good guys might finally win the war, right? be a hard thing to do. That's exactly what God sent Jonah to do. What's the practical application from Jeroboam II? Well, it's this tonight. Do not confuse temporal blessings with spiritual health. Don't imagine that because the economy is good, because the military is strong, because the borders are secure, because the nation is in a position of advantage, that everything is well. Again, two decades later, we will say goodbye to the northern kingdom. They will be gone. They will be destroyed. We just finished chapter 14. They are destroyed in chapter 17. You are right on the cusp of it, right? What does all of this mean? Let me close with this. Each of these histories regarding the various kings of Israel and Judah only demonstrate the need that God's people have for a true king who will rule righteously. During the period of the judges, the refrain was, there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. But this did not mean that simply establishing a monarchy would solve Israel's woes. Spiritual problems cannot be resolved by political solutions. Israel's problems were not political. 
They were fundamentally spiritual. They needed a king, yes, but not merely a king in a central government. They needed a true king of righteousness who would establish and maintain peace between Yahweh and his people. And that king would never arrive until Jesus came. The history of the monarchy is sobering, and it could be discouraging to see the never-ending cycle of corruption, idolatry, and wickedness in high places. But this history should also fill us with hope, because God did not abandon his people. He did not give up on them despite their many sins and the justification that he had for doing so. Instead, he patiently bore their sins and covenant breaking in order to fulfill his promise to their fathers and to bring forth a true king and savior who is Christ our Lord. And I think that is what you are supposed to see ultimately in this period of the divided kingdom. We can get lost in the weeds. There are a lot of important lessons. We're trying to make sure that there are practical applications. We're seeing how God's truth is meeting us where we live. But the overarching theme is always Jesus. It's always Christ. It's always saying, how is this pointing me to him? Don't be discouraged by this history. Be encouraged that God maintains his covenant and his promises even when the people have forgotten about those promises entirely. God is going to put Christ on the throne, and indeed he does. Praise God for that.